to introduce someone else who, who represents an organisation which is equally critical to the uh, survival and continuation of our heritage around the country, not just in industrial heritage, but actually many aspects of our heritage. Um, Carol Souter, the Chief Executive of Heritage Lottery Fund. I'm just going to check that I can do this before I get... Oh, yeah, hooray. OK, good morning, everybody. Goodness me. Standing at the back as well. Um, it's fantastic to be here this morning with all of the partner organisations, and I'd just like to start by thanking our teams who've made it possible and who've done all of the putting together of this programme. Uh, as some of you might know, we recently at the Heritage Lottery, Lottery celebrated our 21st birthday. S since uh, we were first set up in 1994, um, we have been able to invest more than six billion pounds in a huge range of projects across the UK. Uh, and I'd like to say a special thank you before I go any farther to Heritage Lottery players, well, lottery players generally, actually, who raise the money we're able to distribute. And I'm going to start by embarrassing you all. How many of you play the National Lottery? Well done you, because without you, we would not be able to invest 400 million pounds a year in the nation's heritage. And we do need to remember that. That is where all of our money comes from. So we all know that the Industrial Revolution brought new technologies and processes which revolutionized the way we lived and worked. Large factories were built, and people were drawn away from rural areas into rapidly expanding towns and cities. Today, as a result, many of those towns and cities have an extraordinary collection of historical industrial buildings, a visual legacy to the backgrounds to where we live. In London, for example, 50% of all buildings were, conducted, uh, were constructed during this new industrial era, according to Historic England. But the impact of the period goes much deeper than simply the buildings. It goes into the nicknames of our football teams and sporting venues into the music and art we produce, and into the street signs and place names that we walk past every day. And it's this aspect of heritage which is the most significant element, perhaps, in helping places develop a distinctive identity for the future. Because historic buildings provide a unique and evocative backdrop to ongoing development and change. Manchester was the obvious place to be here today. Um, I know that others claim the title of cradle of the Industrial Revolution, but we'll go with Manchester for now because we're here. Um, we've heard of Cottonopolis, but there were many other, many other uh, industries which were housed in and around the city, printing, precision engineering, chemical production, transport. And so railways, canals, and all of the other paraphernalia of those businesses were made here. The rise and fall of those industries have shaped the way the people of Manchester see themselves and how the city and its residents are seen by others. Its industrial heritage reflects those influences today, right across the city. And over the past 250 years, the urban landscape and its surroundings have been forged by the fate of its industries. In more recent times, Manchester has been remade from the redevelopment of magnificent city centre buildings like the Royal Exchange and Corn Exchange to the conversion of mil warehouses and mills. As Sally said, the HLF has invested over 120 million to date in Manchester's heritage assets. And like the city authorities, we believe that heritage should have a strong place at the heart of any future plan for Manchester. Because this city is at the forefront of a vital debate about the future of place and of governance. But if you draw a 50-mile radius from the centre of Manchester, you bring in many more towns and cities, places like Leeds, Liverpool, Stoke and Sheffield, many of which we'll hear about later today, all of which are formal industrial powerhouses looking for the future to make use of that industrial heritage. Much like those pioneering places, many former industrial towns and cities are once again taking on additional powers and responsibilities to think about their futures. I hope those will be positive futures. I believe that far from being a hindrance in the forging of new identities, heritage and history is a tool around which we can weave regeneration, economic growth, civic pride and distinctive identities. One of the strengths of HLF, like Historic England, is the breadth of view we're able to take. 
and the research that we've been able to do, learning from our grant applicants and recipients and from the progress of projects that we've funded. In March this year, we published 20 Years in 12 Places, some work that was carried out for us by Britain Thinks. The key findings, other than that they like it, were that 93% of residents saw heritage as important to the country and 80% thinking that heritage makes their place a better place to live. They had transactional connections. It was good at making nice things to do. And emotional connections. Conserving and discovering aspects of heritage has personal meaning for local people. In Glasgow, people were particularly proud of the distinctive industrial heritage and its role as the second city of empire. The heritage speaks of Glasgow's history, people, culture. They see the world around them as a key part of their own sense of self, in essence, their identity. We've also recently done some work with the Royal Society of Arts on the impact of heritage, including the Heritage Index. Um, this is the first time we've brought together, or the RSA did the work, uh, 100 data sets for a particular local authority area, measuring heritage assets, like museums, ha historic houses, nature reserves, and activities, membership of the National Trust, particip participation in archeological digs, heritage open days. We think the index can help everyone to better understand heritage identity and the potential to capitalize on what makes their area distinctive. If you haven't found it, look on the RSA website. It will show you for your patch what it is that's there, how you can play around with it and find out about the data. Glasgow, of course, isn't alone in feeling pride in its industrial past. But many of those great industrial um, centers face common problems from deeply practical, what are we going to do with these huge mill buildings, to the more strategic, how do we develop the new industries and new ways of working? I'm going to give you a couple of examples now about where these sorts of challenges are being tackled. And I'm going to start with the Edinburgh printmakers, the former head work, headquarters of the North British Rubber Company in Edinburgh, a last standing reminder of a range of industries that once dominated the city in a part of uh, Edinburgh known as Fountain Bridge. At its peak, the rubber plant had a major canal side industrial complex around it, employing 8,000 people and covering more than 20 areas, uh, 20 acres of land. A huge range of products were, were made there, not just the products of the rubber company. It pioneered the development of the Wellington boot, um, which in the First World War was produced day and night for the troops at the front. Even as late as the 50s, there were over 3,000 people employed in this important industry. Yet, the site became derelict, sat vacant and unused for many years. Buildings around it were demolished. And then, in 2011, consent was sought to demolish it too. But forward five years, and Fountain Bridge is changing. The old industrial site is once again coming to life. In regeneration plans will see over 600 new homes built, a new high school, 140,000 square feet of new office space and a range of shops in eight acres of landscape grounds. And the rubber company headquarters, thanks to a five million pound investment by the Heritage Lottery Fund, is being brought back to life. It will turn it into a 21st century hub for creative industries, a historic anchor in a rapidly changing area. Up and down the country, we're investing lottery players' money in these sorts of projects and these sorts of buildings. We know that new ideas very often need old buildings. We've got the research evidence that shows that where new ideas and new activity are most likely to happen are centered in historic quarters and historic buildings. They've got a greater concentration of businesses linked to the most productive parts of the economy. They're highly attractive to entrepreneurs, far more likely to be occupied by non-branded businesses that give places a sense of distinctiveness. In fact, across the UK, the businesses listed, based in listed buildings make an annual contribution of £47 billion and employ almost 1.5 million people. So, in order to build on that, we introduced a new programme 
called Heritage Enterprise, which is how we are able to save the former British rubber mill. It aims to unlock the potential of derelict vacant buildings so that they can become centres for new ideas and productivity, so that they're not barriers to growth, but they're catalysts. We've funded a lot of projects since 1994, not a few of which have already been mentioned, the coffin, coffin works, Middleport Pottery, etc., etc. But we know that what we often find is that the cost of repairing and putting back into use the histo historic building is greater than any likely uh, value once that project is completed. So what Heritage Enterprise does is unlock the dominant but powerful potential of these unused heritage assets. Grants of up to £5 million, and we're encouraging not-for-profit organisations such as community groups and social enterprises to work with the private sector to come up with the projects that will deal with um, these sorts of uses. It's a new kind of funding for us to plug the gap between the starting value of a heritage asset, the cost of repairing and adapting it, and the outturn value. We know that the demand is out there, and we knew that it was going to be when we introduced the programme uh, since in 2013. We've allocated almost £80 million of funding through this programme since then. In Northern Ireland, £5 million has been awarded to the Harland and Wolf Drawing Offices in Belfast. Duncan mentioned the Titanic dock in Liverpool. This is the Titanic quarter in Belfast. Once one of the largest shipyards in the world, uh, the derelict building will be transformed into an 87-bedroom hotel, creating more than 100 jobs and bringing wider economic benefits to Belfast through enhanced tourism. We've awarded £4 million to Harvey's Foundry. This is very close to my heart. This is Cornwall. Um, the project is the final piece of the jigsaw for the local area and will complete the decade-long regeneration of the entire foundry site. And just last month, we announced £2.5 million to Birmingham's iconic but underused Roundhouse. For the last decade, it's sat disused, falling deeper and deeper into disrepair, but it's now set for a new lease of life as home to a range of businesses creating up to 20 new jobs and enabling up to 50,000 people to access and enjoy the site. I would argue that HLF has been pretty good at supporting forward movement and progressive thinking over the past 20 years through the research we undertake and the successful projects that we fund. We're demonstrating how val valuing heritage and investing in identity makes good economic sense, and I'm con convinced that it's a good use of lottery players' money. But, and here's the, ch the challenge for everybody, we can't do it on our own. We can't recruit the commercial operators who will run these businesses and sustain revitalised buildings. We can't offer commercial loans and additional investment which all new businesses need to grow and thrive. So it's only when we join forces as funders, local authorities, communities, developers, entrepreneurs, investors and business people that we can ensure the full value of our heritage is realised. Together, we need to ensure that heritage enterprise is as widely known as possible so that we can maximise its value. We're especially mindful that we're better known to some constituencies than others. It's second nature for many within the heritage sector to consider the HLF as a potential partner. But private developers, creative businesses and planning officers may sometimes be less familiar with who we are. How could that be? But sometimes they are. So it's especially important to spread the word about Heritage Enterprise and our other funding programmes to those audiences. We can build distinctive, vibrant, viable places that we all want to see. We can deliver the much-needed regeneration and jobs that growth can bring. The evidence that we can do it exists. The funding to make it happen is in place. You have all got the commitment to deliver it. We need your help to spread the word and make sure that people know where to come for help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. That's a fascinating overview of the contribution that, that HLF has made. And uh, um, if I could just say, although she's announced that she's leaving not till next April, I'm pleased to say, I would like to just say a personal thank you, because I think it's probably the biggest audience I'm going to get a chance to say it in front of before she goes, to Carol for the huge support that she has personally given our organisation and so many others in the heritage sector in her time at HLF.